Arrowhead. Sally is having a bad night, which in itself is nothing new. Sleep had long since become a luxury. The question here is only whether the funeral made it any worse. The thoughts of it scurred at the edges of her mind, and perhaps it does affect her a little in the end, even if not consciously. Or perhaps it's just the weather. Finger by finger, toe by toe, she frees herself from the clutches of sleep paralysis. It's a technique she's mastered by now. With the few hours of sleep under her belt, Sally can forget about getting any more rest tonight. If she's not that tired, the fear will keep her well awake. And she has better things to do than toss and turn in futile attempts at wrestling her mind into serenity. If she plays it right, she might even have time for a breakfast other than a dry bread roll on the go. She did promise herself to enjoy the small things in life after all. On her way to the bathroom, Celie passes by the alcove with the picture of Mino. Hung over the empty dog bed she can't get herself to throw out seven months later. She still remembers, wallowing in sorrow, on the day he was put down. She can feel sadness. She isn't broken. No. Today just isn't a day. Taya stands in front of the mirror, looking at her body covered only with a diaphanous slip. The black funeral dress is ironed and ready, but she doesn't want to put it on. Eventually she will, though her skin crawls at the thought she has to wear it for the wrong man. It was eight months, three weeks and five days ago that she wanted nothing more than to tear off her hospital scrubs and don this dress. Stop, she tells herself for God knows which time. But it works for once. Her thoughts drift back to the funeral and Sally. Taya wishes she knew why they had to go. But the best thing she can do for her friend right now is not to ask. Finally dressed, she knocks at the door to her brother's room. He's still asleep after the night shift at the bar. I'm leaving for the funeral, she says in a half whisper, and though he mumbles something in response, she knows he'll be calling her in a few hours with a badly concealed panic in his voice, she considers leaving him a note, but she won't. There's a part of her that needs that phone call. Artie's half of the rent lies on the dresser for her to take. Late as always, but there nonetheless. It crosses Taya's mind that maybe perhaps what if Artie's stupid life choices were in fact the good ones. That when all is said and done, it won't be him looking up to her with jealousy in his features. Half past nine, Sally is downstairs, leaning on the street lamp and waiting. Twenty minutes pass and Taya's car shows up on the turn. Hey, Sally greets her as she gets inside. How are you doing? asks Taya. She looks good in black. Same as always. Taya looks unhappy with the answer, but she doesn't have the strength to argue. The bags under her eyes grow more prominent each day, and the once genuine smiles seem more and more forced. They arrive at the funeral home. The clouds dispersed and the sun bathes the grim building in its cheerful glow, as if it wanted to be contrary on purpose. Sally! Sally's mother squeezes past the half-open door and approaches them, knocking her stilettos on the stone pavement. Anna. Sally nods in greeting. It's been a long time since she called her mother anything but that. 
The fresh widow attire looks astonishing on Anna, and Silly has no doubt her mother knows it too. No one will notice when morning slowly molds into fashion and the distinguished black laces become her default style. Taya is silent, but follows Silly closely behind. They find their two chairs in the front row. When the ceremony begins, Taya tries to take Silly's hand, and for some reason the kind gesture breeds annoyance. Silly swats it away and whispers, I'm okay. It makes her angry that someone could think she's grieving. When Anna finishes her eulogy, Silly meets her eyes and dares her to call her up. But Anna knows better. When she steps down, Taya relaxes. She was afraid there would be a scene, hmm? Not an outlandish expectation, that. One of Silly's aunts goes next, and then whoever feels like it. Whatever. Silly's only here so nobody from the family gets any pretext to ask her useless questions. When the music begins to play, Taya suddenly leans in and whispers, I will try the device, Silly. Silly looks at her with a frown. I need help, Taya says. I can't breathe, I can't sleep. I need help. Silly rolls her eyes. Ever since Taya found out about the charlatan and his demon-spotting machine, she's been spiraling about whether she should or shouldn't visit the man. I still think it's a hoax or a bad idea, Silly says. I know, but look at me. And look at yourself. We should go together. That's sweet, but no need. I'm fine. At home, Silly stays away from her desk, as if she and it were magnets of the same polarity. It's only when she's finally worn herself out and heads for the bed that by the corner of her eye she sees the sheet of paper lying on the top. The title says Eulogy and underneath sit three lonesome words just in case. To write anything more Silly would need more than a few measly days the refrigerated carcass provided her with. To the surprise of no one, she wakes up not long after dawn. The shadows of tree branches don't yet reach the frame of the painting hanging over her bed. Four hours of sleep, give or take. The clock is far to the side, she can't see it. Her body is frozen in place, paralyzed. And though her mind feels awake, she reminds herself it's stuck between the dreamland and reality. Whatever she feels, whatever she sees, it's not real. But she doesn't see much. There is no monster at the feet of her bed. There isn't any sitting on her chest. The weight that pushes down on her lungs, threatening to suffocate her if she makes a wrong move, has no source. It's like the very air collapsed on top of her. Oh, it's worse than usual. It's definitely worse. She listens to her own wheezing breath as she does what she can to awaken. She must hurry. The worst part is yet to come. Sally looks paler than usual when they meet under the demonologist's office. It's almost as if she thought it a competition or a challenge. Which one of them will fade away first? What do you expect to see? Sally asks Taya, more interested in that than whatever the man will have to show. She always found it hard to believe anything but ironclad facts. Taya shrugs. I really don't know. If he's a scammer, 
He'll have a tough task ahead of him, because I have got no clues for him to latch on to. She did her research. She knows how fortune tellers and the like operate. Good. The door to the private apartment, number eight, is inconspicuous. A classy silver plaque, nailed to the top frame, says simply, We all have our demons, but they're not who we are. Surprisingly, it's Sally who knocks first. <laughs>